Hey everybody, it is Kai and I am back for my weekly chat with season seven of Alone Participants. And I'm really excited about this. I have uh, Amos coming on the chat tonight and I'm really excited to talk with him. I haven't uh, talked with him since the show has aired so um, besides on our our group chat so I'm excited to just connect with him and share that connection with you guys so thank you for joining us and if you've got questions for Amos or myself um, type them in the comments and I got a whole page of, of questions for Amos but if there's something specific that you guys are excited uh, to ask him about um, shoot me the the question in the comments and I'll I'll try to uh try to answer them. So um last week and the week before I was with Mark and Callie and it went really really well and I put them up on YouTube so if you didn't get to watch them then oh well actually I guess they're also on my um Instagram TV thing so you can just go there if you want to watch it. Um I forgot about that but yeah so we're just gonna wait for um <laughs> the bushcraft bodybuilder I'm curious to know what that's all about we do a lot of like forest training uh out here as well so it's kind of fun um but uh yeah so they're on YouTube and also on Instagram uh TV um so yeah we're just waiting for um Amos to join. Someone, Holmes Matt, asked if I would do it again. Um, would I do it again? Oh, here comes Amos. I guess we'll talk about that question in a Yes. Hi. <laughs> I think I'm here. Yeah, I can hear you. It's a bit quiet. Okay, let me Let's see. You still there, Alice? Yeah. No. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yeah, I can hear you now. That's much better. Okay. There is a um, there's a table light behind you. Can you turn oh. that off? Nice. That's perfect. Nice. How are you? Good. Good. Um, life uh, has been great. Yeah. We've been surviving the pandemic. <laughs> That's what we do, you're we survive. In, yeah, you're in Indianapolis, correct? Yeah. Yes. How is the, are you guys on total lockdown or what's the situation there? Uh, it was for a little bit. Uh, everybody was trying to follow protocols. Then I think everybody got a little loose there. And now all the cases are going up again. So yeah, just trying to wash your hands. Stay <laughs> yeah. In. With a mask and uh, follow yeah, the protocols. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's a strange time we're living in, and this makes connecting like this even more important. So thank you for for accepting my request. <laughs> thank you for organizing it. Thank you for taking the time to yeah. do this. Yeah, I no know, problem. No, I know Sorry, a lot of people ahead. have been asking um, about the show. There is only a little amount of time that gets shown about us. So I'm glad that you're taking the lead on this project and taking some time yeah. to do these interviews. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So we haven't spoken since the last episode airs uh, or aired. How how are you feeling now that it's all over, like over, uh, <laughs> you know, are you going back to some semblance of normal or how 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 are you feeling? Yeah, it was really strange how everything happened. Um, <clears throat> when we were trying to survive out there in the 
in the great slave lake the this madness of 2020 was just starting to boil and uh yeah it's been uh it's been a weird year man it's been really crazy we've been trying to stay busy trying to stay working trying to um strengthen um our roots with uh our place with our with our friends and family trying to strengthen connections because i feel like during these crazy times that's what we need to do um grow food grow our own gardens uh gardens try yeah. to learn how to survive um which doesn't mean just the way we were doing it just out there in the woods is uh it's a real real thing to that we're doing as humans trying to survive in this fast paced fast moving society with viruses and crazy people yeah. out there yeah 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 so are you guys like what are you guys up to now are you working full time or are you out of work or what's what's your situation there well we had a small business we help a lot of clients in their everyday needs and now uh, when the pandemic happens pretty much everything stopped um all our businesses stopped but a few weeks after that we started working again uh, we're being really careful with our coworkers um i've been trying to develop a curriculum and develop uh, a class with my friend Ma Shu and a couple other people that are helping. Mm -hmm. And we want to launch a class, a survival class in spring, next spring. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so we've been working just, we haven't done, I've been hunting quite a bit. Yeah. And uh, trying to develop this survival class that we're going to launch next spring. And, yeah. uh, I'm doing a little work here and there, um, yeah. but yeah, no, with the pandemic and with all the work after the show that we were doing with the school I work at, White Pine Wilderness Academy, um, I've been staying busy with them. We're trying to, um, we're organizing a non-for-profit as well, and yeah. uh, that one is to acquire land so we can continue mm -hmm. teaching survival skills, nature connection. Uh, we want yeah. to be good stewards of the land. And uh, so, yeah, there is a bunch of projects that we're working on. It's hard to, you know, how to put them all together right now because I have a, a lot of rods on the fire, like they say. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the class is an important one. It's basically a comprehensive, uh, uh, wide-reaching survival class. Um, uh, pretty much based in a little bit in the plan of action that I used in when I went to my survival quest. Of mm. course, focus on the sacred orders, uh, shelter, fire, water, and food, but also in the other aspects that yeah. I was able to focus on, like the psychology of survival. Um, mm. um, a bunch yeah. of, yeah, we're trying to work on that. And the non for profit uh, for uh, getting land is another big project we're working on. So it, it's mm. fun still yeah yeah well you talked about you know the the survival of uh or sorry psychology of of survival and like you said like there's obviously the basics food shelter um you know that kind of thing but then the psychology of it is a whole nother uh ball game and so um when i talk to my friends and family anytime you know your name came out it was always oh, i love amos he's so <laughs> And then people would pause and like think about what to say. And like, you know, some of the top words were just Zen as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that one. About. Uh, you know, <laughs> calm, cool, collected, level headed, uh, kind, you know, like, so these are these things that are such um assets for survival and so mm -hmm. i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and um have you always been this way or do you think that maybe some of your uh tough times in el salvador in the war um attributed to that um or yeah like where has that come from 
Yeah, um, that's a yeah, that's a big question. I don't know the uh, the war in El Salvador that just made me crazy and gave me some <laughs> PTSD. Oh um, no, it's uh, no for real. This uh, it the psychology of survival is uh, is such an important part of the survival journey. I feel like there is a lot of people that are very capable of making a fire, making a shelter, not handling a knife, hunting, but they're not able to keep a cool level head when they are in a stressful situation. Um, I feel like the war did teach me a little bit on uh, that aspect. That if I just let the emotions and the adrenaline take over my body completely without me having some sort of control on my body, then you can barely act. You are not capable of going through whatever situation you are going through. Yeah. Um, I feel like there are a bunch of techniques that can help people do that. Like, for example, uh, when I go hunting, um, I go hunting, I'm in the ground or up in a tree, and I see my, the, for example, if I'm on deer hunting, I will see a deer coming. And people that hunt can relate to this probably. Uh, it's called a target panic, or some people call it back fever. Um, yeah. It's whatever, the adrenaline basically takes over your body and just, yeah. It gives you the shakes and you start your hands, your feet, whatever, you start shaking and it's hard yeah. to control it. So a technique that I use in hunting is just start breathing. Uh, count to six when you inhale, count to six when you exhale and keep doing that until you can, your eyes start focusing again. Um, try to think before the actual situation happens, how you can control it so you don't go ahead and start uh, shaking right away. Uh, it's the same, I feel like, uh, when you're in a survival situation. When you're in a survival situation, you are running pretty much on adrenaline, a bunch. Yeah. yeah. Um, you are always supposed to be aware to see if there are animals after you. You're always looking for the next meal. You're always trying to see if you're taking the right steps so you don't fall. Or trying not mm -hmm. to cut yourself with your axe or your knife. And mm -hmm. um, if you keep a constant, I call it baseline. Uh, mm -hmm. If you try to stay on baseline, mm -hmm. um, you can uh, control your breathing, control your thoughts, control your actions. Um, so yeah, it was one of the, it was part of my, I call it my operational plan, my plan of action, the plan I used to take there. Basically, I, mean, I made a mental note, like a map. It was like a mantra. Yeah. And I will yeah. every day try to go over my mantra. Um, basically try to stay on baseline yeah. not only when i'm walking but also in mental in my mental state try to stay tranquil try to stay breathing uh don't rush yeah. um, mm -hmm. try to do one thing at a time doesn't mean just just focus on the one thing i can't do that i like to do a lot of projects uh sometimes a few at the same time what i'm yeah. saying is that if you are carving try to stay focused on when you're cutting not just start talking to the camera and yeah. And then some bad situation happened. Um, also techniques like um, some people call it inner tracking. When you look at, it's pretty much like tracking out there where you look at tracks, you find patterns in the tracks mm. to figure out what animal you are following or what direction the animal is going. You do the same thing, but internally, you look at your patterns of behavior. And you see yeah. your trigger points and like, wait, what is, why is, why am I so angry? Oh yeah, I'm really hungry. That makes sense. And I try, like, try to control that. Oh, yeah. why am I rushing so I Oh, because it's getting late. If I rush, I could yeah. have an accident. Um, yeah. And, and also, yeah, I try to stay positive, smiling. Um, mm -hmm. Once you start getting into a really sad state or a really angry state, uh, I feel like it's really hard to get out of it. So, yeah, I have gone through a lot of stuff. I have seen destruction 
um, really bad people do bad things to family members and people that I care about and people that I just, you know. Um, so I feel like I have seen a lot of bad things. I try to stay positive because it helps me physically and mentally. Um, yeah. I'm not like always like happy. Like I go through my times too where I get depressed and I need to like do a cry or or if I uh, like I will if somebody's trying to hurt my family, my mother, my partners, I will think that all you know, some angry man will come from inside me and try to defend my my daughter or something like that, you know. If I just don't want to get there, you know, I just try to work, try to think about yeah. What are the patterns of behavior? Like, if I'm getting road rage or if I'm like getting too angry and like, no way, why are you doing this? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Okay. There are a bunch of techniques that you can use. I feel like there are different mm -hmm. ways um, that you can practice mindfulness. A lot of people mm -hmm. do it with yoga. A lot of people do it meditation. A lot of people just like to think about, you know, have a sit spot and go sit in the woods and think about those situations. So there are a number yeah. of things like that that you can use. And um, for survival situations, there are specific ones that you can use and, uh, and uh, by practicing when you're hunting or when you're going through life, when you're going to, on the way to work and uh, people are making you really angry because they're not driving properly and, yeah. Try not to make, make that trigger you, you know, and try to think yeah. about why it makes you, what are your triggers. And, but, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not like I'm always my, like, yeah, I try, I try to do, always be happy, always have a positive attitude. Um, one, oh, yeah, one of the big things I like to do to try to stay positive is have a, to be grateful, to have gratitude. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. If, if you have gratitude to begin with, Mm -hmm. then everything else kind of falls in place, I feel like. Um, yeah, exactly. That's another important technique, I think, being grateful. So out there, yeah. when I was in the Arctic, I will start every day with gratitude. I will try to yeah. be grateful because I had a shelter, because I had food, um, because yeah. I had a fire, um, because I had tea, water, and I had my family at home. Um mm -hmm. So that's an important survival technique. I feel like being grateful. Um, yeah. Sometimes we're not grateful, even though we have, uh, like Mark says, you know, everything you need, you already have it. Um, and sometimes yeah. we can't think that way. And um, yeah, exactly. We just, I know our society has been very materialistic, very individualistic. Uh, our modern economic system kind of like makes us that way a little bit. People want a lot of stuff. It's just fun to have, you know, especially when technology is, people want a really good phone, people want a really good car because they're using it, they're tools. They're tools, the society yeah. is making us use those tools. So it's yeah. nice to have good tools, you know, um, but it does sometimes materialism uh, has a negative effect on, uh, on our bodies, on the environment, on our planet, on our communities. So sometimes we have to counteract those things and yeah. uh, try to leave the cell phone aside, leave the car aside, and go try to connect with nature. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Louv, uh, an author, uh, coined this term called, um, in his book, I think it was in The Last Child in the Woods, I'm not sure it was that, but the, the mm -hmm. terminology is nature deficit disorder. Yeah, I would feel like a lot of kids yeah, are going book. through that. Yeah, so it's uh, we need a little bit more of nature connection. I feel like to yeah. to take us on that path. Sorry, I'm just sorry, I'm just rambling here. No, it's great. <laughs> this is what it's for. I mean, I think a lot of people just want to hear what you have to say because it is like, yeah. I mean, the the whole alone experience. People feel like they get to know you, but they only know just a snippet of your experience. And so to hear a little bit of your, you know, psychology, uh, I think it came across really well. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's great. Um, so let's talk about when you first got dropped off, you kind of had your key 
sort of mantra, keeping your baseline. And then were you aware, or of course you were hoping, but was, was fish your first strategy or was it big game or what, uh, like obviously you went the fish route because it was working for you, but what were, what were your plans when you first got dropped off? Yeah, the last few days at camp, <clears throat> we were training, just waiting for launch day, uh, training on cameras, getting last instructions for going into the field. I had a couple changes of mind. I was not going to take a gill net because I've been practicing making a gill net. That. And I knew exactly the measurements, how much uh, paracore or fishing line I could use for a gill net. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go there and make three gill nets. I don't need to take one. You know? But then uh, I had some change of mind. I had some, um, how do you call it? I had some um, confusion, let's say, about the rules of the trapping. So I decided not to take trapping wire, even though it was on my list. Oh. Mm-hmm. I think oh, I'm the only one. Yeah, I think I'm the only one that did not take trapping wire. Yeah, yeah. I, I seen Wonia last season, like, well, she did it with fishing line. It's like, I just didn't realize how hard it was to trap with fishing line and three roots and survival yeah. snares are really tough, man. Uh, trapping yeah. wire is really necessary for yeah. <laughs> for, for trapping out there. So um, so I did take a gill net, and I'm glad I did because I set it up right away, and that gave me the chance to go work in my shelter. I started scouting right away for a shelter site. I yeah. walked miles and miles, man. I hit my geofence. They would ping me on the GPS, like, please go back southwest or whatever, you know, where you came yeah. from. Um, yeah. And I did not find a good shelter place for a couple of days. I kept going back to um, close to where I was dropped off by the beach. Yeah. And uh, and I went to train with this fisherman up in Wisconsin. Um, mm. He's a fifth generation fisherman. He's the last mm. fisherman on this island in Wisconsin. And he uh, he had advised me not to come too close to the lake mm-hmm. because of the winter. Mm-hmm. But this spot where I was, was actually facing the lake was on the south side of the spot. I had a really yeah. good protection of trees on the north side. Um, yeah. I felt fairly protected, even though there was a bunch of um, animal tracks. Um, I remember there was a lot of lynx scat in the trees where I was trying to camp and a bunch of wolf tracks. and. Mm. I kind of wanted some of the action too. I wanted to see if I could hunt a bear or a moose and I figured being right there would help. So yeah. even though it was not what I was advised to do, I camped, re- I camped close to the lake and it ended up being um, a good thing I feel for me. I was close to the water yeah. um, I, because it was facing south, the lake was facing, uh, I was facing the lake on the south side. Um, yeah. I, there was a couple of days the the wind was really bad coming from the south and it was pretty scary. Yeah. It was coming through the chimney and I was uh, yeah. like, hey, my shelter gonna catch on fire now, but it didn't. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it was a uh, the plan changed a bunch um, once yeah. you were there. Yeah, I figure. Of course. Yeah, I wanted to do like a star fire in front of my shelter and so I don't have to chop too much wood. I would let the fire cut the uh, the yeah. trees for me. But then just moving full trees to my shelter side was not feasible at all. So I had to chop the wood out there. Yeah, um, yeah I, was, uh, I wanted to do, I feel like hunting was one of my, um, one of the things that I really enjoy doing. I I enjoy primitive hunting a lot, um, mm-hmm. and I thought I was gonna be able to be successful in hunting out there, and that was not the case. I didn't yeah. see any any moose, any bear, any. I would the one that showed up and I found the scat the next morning, but mm. it was nothing like that. So I had to focus a lot on my gill net, on the fish that I was catching. I had to just work really hard on. Cleaning yeah. fish, smoking fish, uh, keeping it safe. Um, yeah. 
then finally getting a couple hours in the day and be like, okay, I can go for a hunt now because I have the clean that wow. I caught today. It's clean and it's on the smoker. And it was that's uh, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it was just like every day. It was amazing. <sighs> Wow. Um, so you didn't bring snare wire and they showed you catching a rabbit with your, you know, primitive uh, snare. And so how many of those snares did you actually set? Did you only have the one? No, I had a few. I had like just over a dozen or two, you know, it wasn't like I would try to put a bunch of them. But then the bunnies were eating. I was trying to make snares out of uh, spruce roots. I was trying to make mm. him out of a uh, paracord. I did find a lure um, at the beginning of my quest, and the lure had a little piece of wire, uh, just a very short, very thin wire. And I've been successful trapping squirrels with that wire. Oh, but nice. Was, but the snare was not big enough for a bunny. Uh, those rabbits are pretty big out there. So, right. so I have trapped a few, a few squirrels, but the bunnies and I wasn't successful until that day. Uh, yeah. I had to use, I put charcoal on the snare to try to cover my smell and to try to yeah. camouflage the snare. And I use a spruce root as the, uh, as the line from the snare to the tree. And uh, yeah, I'm so glad that that one worked. <laughs> I didn't want to no, come back yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, I, yeah, if I knew better, I probably should have taken the trapping wire instead of the paracord, I think. Because I right. could have done all the things I did with the paracord with the trapping wire. And uh, yeah. I could have used it for snaring. But yeah, yeah, that was a difficult part of the quest, trying to trap. Yeah. I spent a lot of time making snares, digging roots, trying to make uh, survival snares. And, and, yeah, um, yeah for me, I, yeah, I... All of the items that I took, like I took any, all of the hunting items I could. So I took snare wire, gill net, bow and arrow, and hooks because I just knew that my land wasn't going to give me everything. You know what I mean? So I wanted to have all of the options so that if my gill net didn't work, which it didn't, then I could fall back on, you know, the bow or the the snares. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, I had 250 snares out. Um, <laughs> and so thankful that I did because obviously the bunnies went well for me um, and the squirrels as well. But um, yeah, the fishing did not until, you know, the ice came in. So yeah, somebody was asking, I just saw. I just saw somebody asking about the items that you took, where you, some of the three most important items, I think. And I feel like, yeah, uh, yeah my axe, that was so important. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, yeah, I think one of the items that I took, that I, uh, I decided to take, in the list that they gave us, one of the food rations items was salt, sugar, and rice. And I decided to take salt and sugar because I didn't want to get dehydrated out there. When you're in ketosis, when you're in survival diet, you get really, really dehydrated. And uh, sometimes what you can do when you're super dehydrated is to put salt and sugar in water and drink it. It's like electrolyte water. It gives, brings you back minerals and salts that you're losing. So this item, I think, was really, really important for me. Every day, I would. So eat a salt little... and sugar was was one item together, or was it salt... two items? No, it was one item: salt, sugar, and rice. But it was only a third of a pound. So it was just a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar, one third of right. a pound of, in 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 rice. Mm. But I did not take it for the rice as much as it was for the salt and the sugar for the electrolyte water. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. feel like with Ada, I would have been having a really hard time trying to stay hydrated because mm. I was mm. drinking like uh, four of my pots of tea every day uh, yeah. as soon as I wake up and then maybe yeah. one more or one around midday, one in the mid-afternoon and one at night. 
And yeah. even then, I was still super dehydrated. I'm like, how is it possible? I'm so dehydrated, and I've been drinking as mm -hmm. much water as I can. But it was, of course, ketosis. Yeah. The survival diet yeah. makes that happen. For sure, um, yeah. I was, uh, I was trying to drink as much chaga. Did you have chaga in your area? I didn't find as much chaga. Yeah, I was so looking forward okay. to make chaga tea. I didn't find much in there. Yeah, that. So I had like an unlimited supply of chaga. So I, I was drinking Lovely. chaga and spruce tea, you know, constantly, like you said. And the tin can that I had was uh, had bare teeth holes in it, so I could only have this much at a time, tea and so it. it was just like <laughs> constantly. And then. Um, I was I would try and eat as many fresh berries uh, as possible uh, to kind of get those sugars in me as well. But um, yeah, the dehydration thing I was definitely aware of because it's so important also to be able to like have liquid in your system to digest mm -hmm. and you know. Yeah, um, your lower intestine needs water. Like I could tell right away if I. Oh yeah, it was tough, man. You need it in order to for your body to be regulated, and so you can go to the bathroom. You need your lower intestine needs a bunch of water, and if, if your body can uh, keep the water, yeah, yeah. It, was, yeah. it was a constant battle, staying hydrated. And I don't think for a lot sure. of people when they teach you about survival, I don't think a lot of people um, put that much emphasis on how important it is to stay hydrated because you mess oh. up with your brain, mess up with your body, your organs. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. So you brought, so you thought your ax, your ration and what else? Um, I had a, yeah, the two core pad and pad. I had my, um, I had a, I did not bring a saw, um, but I had a, a, a Leatherman tool a multi-tool yeah um but i will have used more the multi-tool if i have trapping wire so um yeah my sleeping bag i had a really good sleeping bag um yeah. uh, the paracord yeah the hooks and line i was I yeah was i would say my my axe was my MVT, I was calling it most valuable tool because I, like you, didn't. I didn't bring a saw either um, because I wanted to bring my gill net, so I forfeited the saw. And so, yeah, my all my shelter, all my firewood was all done with my axe. Um, and you know, that's so it, it, it probably took more energy, but also the trees were so small in my area. But it wasn't that much more energy, I think. So exactly, think that's how I felt. Yeah, it's like yeah. with the saw. I feel like with the axe, if you're good with it and you keep it sharp, and um, yeah. it's, you don't need a, a saw out there. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. Hey, Sean's here. What's up, Sean? <laughs> hey, Sean. <laughs> um. So I wanted to go back to when you're talking about like burning big long sticks in your fire. I noticed in your your fire pit had like a barrel or something like what did you do what did what did you find that like yeah the way that it was it was like your wall and then you had like a hole and your fire <laughs> kind of went out your shoulder can you tell us about what was going on there i would love to because i just love the barrel you have no idea and this story is cool uh before i left to canada my friend Matt, the guy I'm working with this class, this survival class we're going to do, um, I was talking to, we were watching other alone shows and we we're like, people are finding barrels out there. Why are not using them for making a fire in your shelter so you don't have to, um, so you can have a more efficient fire, almost like yeah. a rocket stove type of thing. Yeah. And also protection because the sparks will kind of stay contained. They don't yep. have to go up in your shelter, less likely to go up in yeah. flames. Uh, so I I put a lot of thought about it. And I'm like, well, I do want a barrel for my fire in my shelter, but I don't want a huge drum like they're finding out there. I want a smaller barrel. Yeah. But then I was like, well, how am I going to cut the holes on this thing? Because I want like a hole in the top, a hole here, and I yeah. want a chimney on the back, and I only have my axe. Yeah. I don't want to 
I don't want to do my acts by cutting these holes. But yeah. anyways, I just slept on those thoughts. I thought about it. And then I forgot about it. Then I went to the Arctic. Then I'm walking like my second day. And I, have, I haven't even had my permanent shelter site. I'm still on my, my first shelter just with the tarp over me. And I go for that long walk. And um, on the way back, after I reach my geofence, they're like, hey, go back to, you know, your richer area where you can be. I decided to walk towards a patch of blueberries that I had seen. And you wouldn't believe it, man. I, on my walk, right by the patch of blueberries, I find the barrel I was dreaming about. And he already had the holes on it. He had the chimney hole, oh. he had the holes in the front. I'm like, what is this? It's like, for real? I'm like, the production here, my dreams, he and they threw it here. <laughs> I'm like, no way. There is no way that this barrel is here already the way I, I thought about it. So it was like, one of those beautiful, magical moments. This place was so awesome oh. that way. Sometimes you will think about something and this land will just give it to you. It, that was how oh. that wow. some people, you know, it was so beautiful. Like when you are, when you can see tiny remnants of magic left in this world, makes you a believer again, you know, it's like, no, magic wow. happens yeah so that's God amazing hand, it was so cool dude like it's like god walking you you know with your hand so you can like fulfill your dream of walking in this beautiful land or it's like some people call it i don't know how you know it's like whatever you blessed. call it yeah bless it's a it's a miracle it's a yeah. magic thing whatever <laughs> it was cool man so i found the barrel and uh, basically i was able to carry on with my plan which was to bury it the barrel. Uh, my shelter, the I built it on sand. Yeah. So it I was easy that. to it was really easy to dig. I was I made a cold sump, so the cold air and I will get in. Uh, in my bed was a little raised on the side, and yeah. I was next to the barrel. And I had a great time with this barrel, man. The fire was able to do big fires. Uh, I was trying to stay warm at night, so I was wasting wood. I feel but like I felt good at night, burning a bunch of wood and feeling warm at night. <laughs> Still want to be cold, so it was fun. Yeah, I feel like uh, my fires were really found... efficient. Oh, that's good. See, I found a barrel, as you saw, using it as a raft, and I had the exact same thoughts as you from watching previous season. Being like, how can I turn this into a wood stove? Like, that's all I wanted to do was turn that barrel <laughs> into a wood stove. But like you said, there's no way I was going to use my axe to, like, I mean, that that barrel was thick Big. steel. <laughs> like, like, it's not like I could just take a rock and, like, yeah. like that thing was solid. And, um, and, and so, oh my gosh, to have found a small barrel with holes already in it, like, oh wow, that just would have yeah, been amazing. I just, I just couldn't believe my eyes. Yeah, uh, I found a lure that was able to provide a lot of fish for me. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, those just those those little things that happen out there, I feel like they were just such a big part of my journey. Um, yeah. being able to have a good time out there and stay safe. Yeah. Yeah, I found a lure as well, um, which I ended up using. It was a, There was a treble hook, and I used it to make a spoon, exact same as the spoon that you made out of a rusty mm -hmm. can, very, very similar. And that's what I caught the lake trout on. Um, was this, excuse me, was the lure that you found, was it a floating lure or what? What type yeah, of lure was it? It was uh, actually it was one of those T ninety, those banana, those uh, it's a trolling lure. Um, yeah, yeah, it looks basically like a banana with a lip, and I yeah. used it so much. I was say I had amazing fights with huge fish with a lure. It was so much fun fishing with that thing. That's and really then eventually, interesting. Yeah, it was so cool, and eventually the lure started failing. It was getting full of water. And I tried to fix it. I fixed it a couple of times with the fire with a little pine pitch. And I kept using it all the way to the end. And at the end, it was no, 
doing the action that you're supposed to do. It was thinking a lot. It was it was time to retire mm. that lure, but it helped yeah. me a bunch. I'm curious how you use that from fishing from shoreline because I found the same same banana lure, but I was finding like it was just like floating on top, and I just figured it yeah. was not going to work but maybe because my water was so shallow like how did you f find the fish were just coming up and grabbing it or what yeah no so i look for this fishing hole when the helicopter dropped me on my yeah. in the bay it was clearly seen from the air that this was very shallow as well so i had mm -hmm. to walk just uh just a few hundred yards uh east and I was able to find one hole that looked a little deeper, kind of open up like a funnel. Mm. And I seen and I seen fish there, bait fish, and I saw some trout. So that's what I decided for it to be my fishing hole, and okay. end up being productive. Um, mm. So it was just basically one spot in my area that I was able to use for fishing and um, for casting, and it was deep enough for the lure to work. You had to retrieve it a specific exactly. case so you yeah. can have the action to walk towards uh, to swim that way um so yeah as long as i had the same speed when i was retrieving the lure i was able to hook into fish oh, um, amazing mm -hmm. amazing yeah i tried i tried i tried i tried oh man <laughs> that's what i did with hunting man i went out for walks so many walks tried to figure yeah. out where these animals were and i just I yeah. couldn't connect with them. But for me, the walking, the hunting was actually my favorite. One of my favorite parts mm -hmm. was was just going on those walks, you know. And like you were saying earlier on, being mindful when you were walking. So you were like, you, you know, you just have this like consciousness of like seeing and hearing everything around you and like walking just with nature, right? Like you were just like, almost gliding through and you just felt so connected to the land that you were around and you were seeing new area. And then you'd like stop at your favorite blueberry patch and, you know, sit down and have a rest and, or go up on a high, high hill and just, you know, take it all in. And even though I didn't get any big game, I, you know, I got a few bunnies and squirrels with my bow, but just the act of going out and hunting it mm -hmm. felt productive because you, you know, you felt like you were doing something towards obtaining food. Um, mm -hmm. But it was also healing for, for the soul. I felt like. Yeah, totally. I completely connect with that. It was actually my favorite parts about my experience was going on those long hikes. Um, mm -hmm. I remember the, the moon rises when you're like at the end of your day, walking back to your shelter and seeing this amazing, beautiful moon rises. So going hunting and finding a bunch of perfect, perfectly ripe uh, um, berries or uh, or rose hips that were tasting like candy, you know, at the time. <laughs> um, yeah, being able to to try to track games out there. It was my favorite part, actually. Um, yeah. Going on those walks. Uh, I agree. Yeah, totally. for sure. Um, so was there anything uh, about your story, about your journey that they didn't show that you wish they had, or did they focus on something that you wish they hadn't? Like, was there something specific that you were like, man, I wish they had shown that or. Mm, yeah, no, you know, I wish they would have shown me catching fish from, uh, from the shore. Cause that was, I had so much fun doing that. Mm. I wish they had shown me finding the barrel because I was so excited to find it. Yeah. It was such an important part of the early part of my journey. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's um, yeah. I had it's such a crazy journey, so much time that we spent out there every day. And uh, I remember seeing this, some things that were important to me, like, 
going outside and seeing the northern lights or seeing the moon or seeing a double rainbow with the water that reflects towards me. Things that they're so beautiful to me at the time. They're so meaningful, but probably the cameras don't make justice for those shots because, yeah, we have a few cameras, but they're not like super professional with filters and stuff. So um, yeah. I understand, you know, they have to put the sh what's going to sell the movie ticket, I think, you know. So. <laughs> like the wolves. Like the oh, wolves, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they know what they're doing, man. That's why they do multi-million dollar productions. Those guys, they, they do a good job. They know what people want to see. And that's what they do. Yeah. Show. I mean, that was pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> like, those wolves, I mean, so, I mean, they they covered a lot of the footage so but tell me like how long like how many days were they coming around for and then like once you kind of scared them off did they just decide to leave you alone or was this like something that they were were they around you for a long time yeah so for a few days a few weeks you could see them that they're getting closer and closer to your camp um you start seeing tracks and uh, so I will go to my fishing hole and I will see in the snow the tracks and they will stop right there about a, a hundred yards from my shelter. Mm. And then I could, I could tell that those are uh, three wolves. And, uh, but they stop right there. They can, you can, when you're tracking, you can kind of tell a little bit, you can make stories like that, you know, they're like, they look yeah. at my shelter and they're like, oh, yeah. there's a human there, let's go this way. So they go to the right. So you track a little bit away, you can see they went around. And those tracks kept getting closer and closer and closer. Every few days, like once a week, you'll find them and you'll see them closer. Um, but this day, actually, I opened the door and they, they were <laughs> all of them. So Crazy. it was uh, really shocking. But in a way, I wanted to see wolves out there. I really yeah. wanted to see a wolf. Um, so I feel like, yeah, be careful what you wish for in this type of situations. <laughs> when, magic like that is boiling because it does happen and uh, I had the yeah. whole family come and say hi it was really cool I never had an interaction like that with wolves and it was such a special thing to see them so close I mean I could jump and touch them uh, wow. it was so crazy yeah they were that one the big one that they show uh, he was like the alpha male and you could yeah. tell by his body size he was huge Wow. And he was just like, he was no scared, man. He was just right there. He was just going right. back and forth, just going back and forth. And there was another big one that was the white one that was staying behind, a little back. I was like, man, that's probably the alpha female. She's a little smarter. She's like, this guy, <laughs> look, I told you. Don't mess. She knows you got a spear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I told these guys not to mess with humans. And look at those guys in front of him right there. <laughs> no, I... They, they didn't. I didn't feel like they show any aggression. Um, I had a wolf tag. They gave us one, but we were also asked not to shoot them. I was asked yeah. by production not to shoot the wolves. But I did have a tag yeah. in case I needed it, and I decided um, when I saw them to get my bow. I had a stone tip arrow that uh, it was a perf perfect arrow. I was like, if they show any aggression i'll have to show them that it's not gonna be easy so yeah. but i feel like they were twitching a little bit if i move too fast um i didn't feel threatened that way yeah. and i feel like by trying to stay calm by trying to stay on baseline by showing them that you are not filled with fear or anxiety i feel like he showed yeah. them that it was not going to be an easy picking for food Basically, they wanted my fish. They wanted my food. Yeah. And I was like, no, it's mine. And uh, yeah, they left. I never saw them again. I heard them a bunch. And they were right. pretty close when they were howling. But it was just yeah. that experience. It was just several minutes. So looking at them uh, walk really close to me. And just one of the highlights and the most amazing experiences that I had yeah. with wildlife. Yeah. That's amazing. It is amazing. And I think you're extremely lucky to have had that experience mm -hmm. for, you know, that 
up close and personal. I don't think very many people have that. Um, I know I haven't had a whole pack of wolves. I've had individual wolf, you know, mm -hmm. encounters, but not like, you know, that whole, whole scenario, which is amazing. Yeah, I'm um, really lucky to have seen mm -hmm. that. And then the fox, same thing, like after you um, <laughs> shot the fox, did it ever come back or was that the message it needed? <laughs> yeah, I feel like that was the message you needed. Um, I Don't get me wrong, I really did not want to shoot this fox. I didn't want to harm any animals like that. But I had no choice, man. It was like, this is uh, for people that that don't quite understand what we're doing out there. It's a real survival situation. You're out there really just surviving from what you are eating. Um, i seen in uh, previous seasons how decimated your food supply can be by just a single fox. On yeah, all for your sure. trap line, yeah, it was like... And I couldn't get a shot when the fox came really close to me, but it was pretty much under my feet. I had a, wow. I had a little spear, the fishing spear, because I made a couple of spears. I made that long one. Oh, it's right there, I think, the long one with the bunny flare that they show. And yeah. I also had a little fishing spear that had a four prong. And yeah. that was more a smaller one because I had lost a big fish. I was fighting a big fish for a while, and by the time the hook um, came off his mouth, the fish was just in front of me. You know, like I didn't have a spear to... Wow to get in, so I made one. And when that fox came, I had that little spear on my hand and I'm like like trying to push it away and she didn't want to go away. It was just like, wow. and then he left and then he came back and it was just so long the encounter. I was like, this fox is never going away and I don't want it to be get too comfortable. The things that, yeah. yeah, so I shot it and I just never saw the fox again. I'm glad because, uh, yeah. 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 Um, so I, I wanted to ask you about the cold because, um, I, uh, one of the lines, and I don't know if they edited it funny or not, but when you said, um, you said at one point, you're like, I'm really glad I brought my mittens. <laughs> I was just like, to me, I was just like, of course you're going to bring your mittens. Like, I just thought like, I hope he knows that this was like you were no. gonna <laughs> no yeah so. when i said that i was actually talking about that specific morning because it's the first day i look <laughs> the first day i used my mittens and they were not like really good mittens they were these crappy mittens that i had taken i had no clue <laughs> no but that morning i was like holy crap it's so cold outside here it's like i'm gonna go check my net but I think I should take my mittens. <laughs> and I'm so glad I took my mittens that morning because my fingers are frozen. That I was to clean my fish and I had to put the mittens for the first time. It took like 15, 20 minutes for my fingers to warm up back up. Just yeah. 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 So, yeah, I was talking about the specific morning that I was so happy that I took the decision out there because I didn't want to leave the fish out there and come back running to camp because I can warm my fingers. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I had, no, in the terms of the cold, it's a, uh, it's different. I had some experience with cold. I, uh, I live in Indiana. I do winter hunting on cold weather. Um, I go to Wisconsin to uh, Washington Island hunting. And it gets pretty cold out there. I go ice fishing in the same place in Wisconsin. Um, but it's a whole there. other ball game, right? When you're yeah. when you have no fat on your body left. Like, I mean, and that's that was the thing about me. Uh, you know, there was a lot of people, even like the in the participants, they were like, Kai, you're going to crush it because you know winter and, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm like, yeah, but I've never done winter like starving, you know, where I'm like, I have no fat on my body and no, you know, calories coming in. And so what a difference that makes, eh? No, yeah, it's a, it's a whole different ballgame. That's what I'm saying. This experience have taught me so much about my real survival situation. Um, yeah, when, when you are on ketosis diet and when you're under these extreme conditions, it's for real out there. It could, it could kill you really quick. Uh, if you don't have body fat, you're not going to get warm. I mean, it's like, yeah. 
you really need the calories to make to burn them up. You need the body fat in order to make it under these conditions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was basically when I ran out of body fat, I was feeling the cold. Uh, when yeah, yeah. I had, I was very lucky, but I had. At the beginning, I had uh, basically as much fish as I could eat. Um, so I'm really glad because of all the omegas, all the fat in the fish was helping me. Uh, I have a really high metabolism. And uh, I lived in Scotland in 1999. I climbed this mountain called Loch Nagar Mountain. And I went with this guy called Father Emsley at the St. Margaret Church of Scotland and this guy, Jim Bannerman. They asked me in a pub the day before, hey, we're going climbing this mountain. Uh, you want to go? I'm like, yeah, I love climbing mountains. And they're like, well, you have boots? I'm like, yeah, I have boots. And like, I didn't realize I was going to this freaking like snow mountain. After oh hours, God. oh my God, after hours hiking and it's cold. My feet were so cold out there. We came out of this mountain and I feel like my feet got damaged in there a little bit. Right. Um, I didn't get frostbitten, but I feel like my nerve endings on my toes were feeling um, raw after. So i kind of sensitive to the cold. And um, and yeah, I'm from El Salvador. I grew up in a tropical country. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, good gear and uh, lots of wool, good clocks and some food will get you through. But the limited amount of food and the never-ending cold conditions are like just sucking your calories out of your body. Uh, you yeah. really need thousands of calories just to keep you going for a few days. Um, you're yeah. working so hard every day, cutting wood, yeah. walking, hunting, trapping, fishing, um, just any, everything that you need to do to survive out there. Um, yeah. It requires so many calories and... Uh, yeah, once you are out of them, there is no point. Um, there is no yeah. point of keeping going if you don't have food. It's just a matter of uh, how much damage you want to do to your body and your mind after you yeah, are exactly. out of food. Yeah. And so when you walked away, were you completely out of fish or did you have some and you were just like, well, like, it's, you know, I'm not catching anymore. So it's sort of the end or what was... Uh, for the two weeks previous to my tap out, the fish had diminished. Um, I have food pretty much every day on my stay. And I still had the rice that I took as my food ration because I hadn't gone through that. I was just pretty much eating my fish, the salt and the sugar and uh, teas and berries. Yeah. Uh, but I had been rationing the previous two weeks. I started to ration the few fish that I had. And, yeah. uh, first, I was eating whole fish, full fish in one sitting. And save That's the so for, crazy. Uh, yeah, that huge fish. Dude, it's like, I just felt like my body was capable of storing the food. So I was trying to eat it. I have a high right. metabolism and I was burning it, man. So I was just trying yeah. to eat as much as I could. But the last two weeks, I was rationing the fish. I had it, but I was not eating as much as I could, like at the beginning. Yeah. Um, basically, the decision was I had not wanted the game. In a situation like this, I feel like you need a muskox, a moose, a, a bear, you know, any big game that can provide lots of fat, lots of bone marrow. Uh, brains, whatever you need to get through. And you need fish as well, and you need good trapping skills. All of those, your game has to be pre on to make it out there uh, for a long time. And I, not having the big game that late in the game when fish was diminishing. Yeah. And my bay yeah. took so long for it to freeze, man. My bay was freezing a little bit, and I'm like so excited. Tomorrow it's going to start freezing more and more. In a week, I'll be able yeah. to walk on it. But then yeah. big waves will come and break it all apart, and it's all over again. Right. I had a lot of currents, and I feel like it didn't help my bay to get frozen. So I would have loved to do a little ice fishing, but I never was able to do it. 
the yeah. lake was not freezing like that on my side. Yeah, yeah. I was lucky that I had a big island. It was like a huge island that kind of pinched off my bay and so it was protecting the rest of like the big water mm -hmm. and so on the calm days it would start to freeze over and then but like you said then like wind would pick up and it would just break up again mm -hmm. but I was you know lucky enough that it was so shallow everywhere that on a calm day it was able to just ice up and ice stay up. frozen mm -hmm. So yeah. that was my saving grace for a little bit there. Yeah, and at the end, I would remember trying to fish with my lure, and I would just breaking through the ice, breaking little lines through the ice with my um, with my lure, and sometimes you get caught in the big chunks of ice and pulling them all the way to shore. And right. the line will be so frozen from the temperature, full of water beads, and yeah, fishing was getting really difficult on the shore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the gill net was not working anymore because it was getting stuck to the ice in the shore. And uh, yeah. yeah, the lack of big game, I feel like with big game, I would have been able to stay longer out there, of course. And, sure. Uh, yeah. 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 I think it's understated that uh, it, it it's really easy for someone to look like they could stay out there forever when they've got a big game because of course like you you're looking at a hundred days worth of food so you've got all of this time and energy now that you can spend on you know whatever 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 um so it's easy to be like oh that person could have stayed out there forever it's like well if you turn the tables you know and and give a moose to amos or whatever then like you would have said the same thing about amos he could have stayed forever it's not reality yeah. yeah it's not reality yeah that's that's the tricky part that you yeah, with a bear, you know, it's so much fat on a bear. With a moose, oh. it's so big. All the bone marrow on that animal. Yeah. Like, you can really mm -hmm. provide a lot of calories. And uh, sure. if you know how to harvest them, also the calories out of the animal. Yeah. So after eating so much fish, how much weight did you lose from day one to day 58 in total? About 40 pounds. Yeah, 40 pounds? Having, mm -hmm. That's yeah. quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, before going, like, it was really strange how my situation happened. I did not apply to this show. I was not expecting uh, any way of my life to go on a TV show. You know, I don't watch TV. I don't agree with the whole concept of selling you stuff through the TV, but this was a little different. It's something that I didn't ask or apply for, but so when they called me, I was like, I don't know, but I talked to my mom, I talked to my family, and they're like, well, it's something that you always say you wanted to do, so why not try it? So I'm like, okay, I'll try it. I sent my videos and, and uh, during the last week of casting, and uh, First, they told me, no, you, we're not going to go with you. And then they called me back when I was out in the Badlands on a solo camping trip. Actually, I um, my boss really wants you to compete in New York against these other guys and see if he, if you can be a shot at the show. So I went to New York. And, uh, and then I didn't have that much time to prepare for it, you know. We only had, like, a little time to prepare for it. And I was trying to fatten up. And I was trying to eat so much food, but my body didn't understand what I was doing. Yeah. I was, I was not gaining weight at all. It was maybe the last two weeks of my training before going up that I started to gain a little weight. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I was not able to put a ton of fat on me. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, my metabolism, I think, is uh, was getting shocked and didn't know why I was trying to put my body with so much fat. But um, I feel like uh, I would have had more fat than maybe, yeah, a few more days. You can get a few more days on it. 
I'm glad mm. I was eating healthy food before I left because I was feeling yeah. good over there, you know, before and after. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. feeling really good mentally, physically. Yeah, good. Well, no, but I was just thinking, like, you had so much food, food and fish, like, you were killing it with the fishing, but to still lose 40 pounds, it just goes to show how much energy mm-hmm. it takes to just be out there um, and to stay warm, like you said in the end. Like, it's, uh, I mean, for our expeditions that we go on, like, we're budgeting people's calorie intake from 35 to 5,500 mm-hmm. calories a day just to stay the way that they are. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, eating, even if you were eating half a fish a day, I mean, that's probably less than 2,000 calories, Mm -hmm. um, you know? And so it's it's just amazing. Um, Yeah. Good on you for getting that much fish. You really did. I mean, you crushed it. And I just like, when I'm watching you, Joel, Mark, and (laughs) Joe, crush it on the fish i'm just like oh <laughs> man. i mean but that you know what it made my first fish that much that's, sweeter that's what i was gonna say man i want to have the feeling you had when you caught that one fish <laughs> <laughs> oh it was a that's good awesome. day, was a good yeah. day. <laughs> yeah no it's uh it's really exciting to get to get a fish out there and uh yeah I was really lucky, man. A ton of pike, a ton of lake trout, a bunch of white fish, and even caught an Arctic grayling. This beautiful fish from out there. The color is iridescent, and it has mm-hmm. a big sail in the back, a long one, beautiful and tasty fish, too. Everything was tasty then, but um, yeah. I thought that fish was really awesome. Um, oh, man. Yeah, I'm really lucky. Uh, I always had, had a connection with fishing. I always liked it. I when I was really young in El Salvador, I saw fishermen at the lake, and I would, would go to the store and buy some hooks and some line, a little lead. I would try on my own, try to learn uh, self-taught fishing by hand, hand lining. Uh, now I do fishing with fly poles or bait casters. Um, yeah. But, but I just enjoy hand lining, too. It's just really fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And this person says, you two are my favorite people from the show. Maybe you could propose a spinoff, Surviving North and South. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I would oh, love uh, to learn from you. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, we can go was... down south to the uh, to the Caribbean. It's really fun down oh. there. And it's, uh, you wouldn't believe it, man. It's really hard to survive down there. You get really dehydrated. The mosquitoes, right. the bugs will eat you alive. You need to learn yeah. some plants out of them. Yeah, you can fish down there. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a, a surviving in the Caribbean with you guys out there. Yeah. <laughs> I got I a couple places you. in mind. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> well, right on. I think we're we're just over an hour now, so we kind of ra- well. I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, but. Is there anything that you want to tell people about what you are doing in the future? Um, make sure that you follow uh, Amos Rodriguez. Uh, is that it? Survival. Just Amos yep. Survival. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, he's tagged in the post so you can check him out. Um, but yeah, is there anything that you want to say to the lovely people that have joined us tonight? Yeah, somebody just let me oh. know this one. How do you tap up play with your shelter catching fire? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because a yeah. lot of people have asked, just let me answer that one really quick. Um, For sure. Yeah, no, it was, it, there was another really, really special part of my journey, uh, the tap out. I, uh, as, you, as you were talking, as you were saying, once you realize that you don't have calories to burn, there is no way to get warm. Uh, the night before, I felt that I didn't have any body fat and... I had a hard time making the decision. I was having a fire, and I remember, like, being really focused on making the decision. And I started to ask, kind of like in my mind, it's like, is it time to go, you know? And the fire would, like, do this, this, I don't sparking. know, some crazy. Yeah, sparking. I'm like, oh, what? That the fire is like trying to agree with my decision. What is it? What is it? You know, and I will doubt it. You know, it's like, was that a yes or was that a no? Anyways, I decided to sleep on it. And uh, basically, the next day, I realized that that was the right decision to do. And I tap out. 
and I'm, I'm so crazy how the place was keeping me uh, closing, like a closure type. The fire was yeah. able to 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 tell me that that was the proper decision to do, and uh, the tap out was what I needed to do, and. Uh, yeah, the fire just started out of nowhere. I don't understand. It's just one of those other things that happened to me that is just completely out of my basic understanding, you know? Um, right. So that's for that. Um, and yeah, the, from the future, yeah, I just, uh, my friend Rachel is helping me with the, with the website. So it's coming up in, uh, in November, early November. And uh our land trust, our non-for-profit is coming out also. Uh, so stay tuned. And uh, we're going to announce also our class for the next spring. Um, it's going to be one of the best classes out there for survival because we have lots and lots of experience with the guys that I'm working on. Um, so, um, yeah, I just slowly we'll announce it. I don't do that much social media. I don't do a lot of presence in these formats, but uh, we'll slowly um, pull some uh, classes and uh, and show people what we're doing. Um, I think the most, what I want to leave people with right now is just to stay healthy, drink a lot of water, uh, try to create strong, sustainable um, communities, try to talk to your neighbor, try to grow gardens, grow your own food, learn how to be connected to nature, learn how to hunt, trap, or fish, and um, yeah, stay safe, stay strong out there. Crazy times out there, so it's time for the good people of the world to come together and um, yeah, fix the environment. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, well, I, I, I think you were an amazing representation of what good human is on this show. And uh, I'm really happy to have been able to be a part of your journey. And thank you for joining me. And yeah, I'm honored to call you my friend. And thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> Same to you, man. I'm so glad that we got this experience that we were able to do it to all the alumni's out there. See yeah. you guys. Yeah. Awesome, Kai. I appreciate okay. you so much. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a good night. And uh, make sure that you give Amos a follow on the Instagram and watch out for his courses. And we'll see you next week with Corey from Organic Archer. All right. Love you guys. Bye. Bye, Amos. Thank you so much. Bye.